This is podcast number 55, and this will be your last podcast for Principles of Biology 2. I'm not going to do the last unit. I think you've got enough uh, Principles of Biology to take you on to Principles 2 after this one. Uh, so this is basically the idea of why do we age, and aging as a uh, emergent property of um, all organisms. And uh, why do it? And you wouldn't necessarily predict that we have to age looking at our component parts the proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and um, uh, lipids. They're all replaceable, so why do we age? Um, but it's a universal thing. You see it in our close relatives, uh, and you see it in us. Uh, see the, these presidents aging. Um, is it because of some force of natural selection and evolution? Uh, so there have been and still are many hypotheses about why we age. There's the idea that um, mortality has a fixed rate over time. And then, uh, and then once you become mature, reproduction is stable uh, as you mature. And then there's the idea that mortality is uh, begins to be low, and then it accelerates, um, and the reproductive capacity increases and then declines. Uh, insects are uh, typical of this sort of situation, and. We are typical more of this situation. Uh, there came, there has emerged a hypothesis that is now uh, at the level of a theory because it's supported by multiple experiments. So I'll go over some of those called the disposable soma. Soma is body. So the idea is that uh, your body is not going to last. It's disposable. Uh, so either you take the strategy of uh, reproducing early to pass your uh, genes on to the next generation or trying to preserve your body and reproduce uh, later um, uh, and live longer uh, in that case um, but the total reproduction may be the same in both cases so um, what this would predict is that depending on the situation uh, if, the si if the environment is stressful um, then it's to a species' advantage to uh, reproduce earlier uh, and to a greater extent because they're not sure that their um, body's going to last. And in less stressful situations, uh, to preserve the body so they can keep reproduction going on longer. Okay. Um, this has been tested uh, pretty extensively. Uh, one of the first experiments was done at the Savannah River Ecology Lab where Dr. Navarowski is going to teach uh, Principles 2. He did his postdoctoral work there and um, he didn't do this work but uh, it was done at the same place where he did his work on lizards and uh, they looked at possums, um, these marsupials that are native to North America. And uh, there were two populations. There was an island population and a mainland population. And the two populations were closely related to each other genetically, uh, but the environment and the situation was different in those two situations. So they put radio collars on all these guys and followed them uh, for their life. So on the island population, there is low predation, low predators picking off these um, uh, possums. And on the mainland, uh, there are, there's high predation, high a number of predators picking off these population. Um, and so uh, island possums tend to live longer um, and mainland possums tend to live shorter. Uh, if you convert these data to natural logs, you can convert it to a 
um, straight line and you can see the slope of those straight lines is different. Um, steeper slope in the um, mainland population indicating that they don't live as long. Okay. So if they don't live as long on the mainland, you would expect, based on this disposable soma hypothesis, that they would want to reproduce faster um, than uh, uh, the island population. So do they? So in the island population, these guys only reproduce for two years, typically. Um, and in their first year and their second year, their uh, uh, rate of reproduction looks pretty similar. Uh, total litter mass in terms of grams of um, uh, little possums that they're producing versus how old they are. Um, and on the mainland, however, uh, they have a difference in their first and second year. So looking at the the island population plotted on the mainland data, uh, their second year looks just like both years in the island, but their first year uh, they're producing um, more pups uh, and heavier pups in their first year. Um, but maybe it's because living on the island just is gives you more of an advantage uh, and it's just easier to live there in general because of the lack of predators but in fact some things on the island are worse so if you look at uh, the number of ticks that they have um, it's uh, quite a lot higher uh, on the island than it is on the mainland um, but blood glucose level in terms of you know how well are they eating um, uh, that seems to be about the same. Um, so this as an indicator of other stresses other than predation, um, uh, like parasite stress, it's not that just living on an island is cushy. Um, it's, uh, it just seems to be that uh, if, it, if you somehow know as a possum how long you're going to live based on um, the predation pressure that uh, the, you'll adopt a life history strategy that means um, stretching out your life uh, and your reproduction longer than if you know that you're not going to live as long um, on the mainland somehow you know that based on predation pressure then you're more likely to have more and bigger babies earlier. Uh, does this hold out for other animals? So this that was an experiment done out in the field uh, where animals really live. This was done in the lab where you can control more factors and uh, have a bigger sample size. And this is done with fruit flies. We've seen experiments with fruit flies before where they manipulated the mortality rate. In the high mortality rate fruit flies, they killed 90% of all the adults uh, every generation. In the low mortality rate, they only killed 10% of adults. And then they wanted to see what effect does it have on these different characteristics of their life history. Okay, the one thing really to look at here is the fecundity, which is the average number of offspring uh, uh, for uh, each of the flies. And in the high mortality rate, they have more offspring than in the low mortality rate. Uh, how about plants? Uh, plants have a really different life history. Do they follow this idea? And there's variation among these plants. And so if we look at uh, the variation, there are plants that reproduce later and plants that reproduce earlier. This is called bolting. If you have a garden um, and the plant uh, sends up a reproductive flower uh, early, that's called bolting. So uh, these plants are reproducing earlier and they produce fewer leaves. These fruit plants are reproducing later and they produce more leaves. Here is that if you flower late, you dedicate more energy to your leaves uh, and you live longer um, and then eventually reproduce. But if you 
bolt fast and you uh, uh, you dedicate less energy to your leaves and you reproduce earlier. So that's consistent with the idea of disposable soma and but in plants. Um, how about bacteria? A lot of um, places you'll see that bacteria don't age or single-celled organisms don't age. Um, this was uh, experiments done where they uh, were able to track the age of bacteria, which is not easy thing to do. And I think most of the idea of that bacteria don't age is just because it's difficult to measure it. But these guys could measure it. So if you have a single-celled organism, it has two poles labeled O and 1. They can color them different colors, blue and red. And uh, as that cell divides, uh, one is going to be older and one is going to be newer in terms of age. Okay, So in this div divided cell, it's going to have uh, a pole that is older uh, on this side and then the pole that is newer on the middle. Um, and then you can continue following that as the uh, bacteria continue to divide. And in this uh, third generation here, you get uh, this edge here is the oldest pole uh, that's been there since the beginning. And this edge here is the oldest pole that has been there since the beginning. And you can continue to track these over time um, and separate them so that you can try to track longevity in these bacteria. Uh, and at first you don't see much of a difference. Uh, the length in the vertical direction is an idea of um, uh, longevity with uh, faster growth being a longer line and short growth being a, uh, or slower growth being a shorter line. Um, and eventually you get, after eight generations, you get on the right side, you get the slower growing, older um, uh, bacteria. And on the left side, you get the longer growing, see these lines are longer than on this side, um, faster growing, um, faster living bacteria. So even in bacteria, there uh, there is a difference in um, how long an, an individual quote unquote uh, would live. And in general, older cells grow slower and that bacteria do age. Um, so the older cells are over here, they're growing slower, and the newer cells are over here, they're growing faster. Uh, just plotted on uh, a different sort of plot. Um, the average growth rate of cells with new poles um, is faster than with old poles. It's slower and decline. Okay, uh, so that's a lot about what affects uh, the rate of living. There has also been mutations uh, discovered that dramatically increase longevity or lifetime. A lot of these experiments have been done with C. elegans, which is a um, uh, experimental uh, model organism uh, in the lab. It's something we use in cell physiology lab and they can be grown on a petri dish and there are these little millimeter size worms. And if you look at uh, wild type worms, they tend to live about 16 days, so it's a good experimental organism for scientists who are humans studying lifetime because then you don't have to wait forever for them uh, to, to die off. And they've discovered mutants uh, in these worms that live significantly longer, more than twice as long, almost three times as long as your uh, wild type uh, um, worm. Um, the short-lived wild-type worms have a bigger uh, brood size, so they have more offspring on average each time that they have offspring. 
and the longer lived have fewer on average. Um, okay, after 10 days, uh, how many uh, uh, offspring are you going to have? Well, after 10 days, this is a pretty old worm, and so they're not really reproductive uh, later on in their life, but these guys still are because they're only a, a quarter of the way through their life. Um, the day, how old are you when you lay your last egg as a uh, C. elegans hermaphrodite? Um, uh, uh, they can lay, wild type can lay eggs as late as 11 days, um, but uh, these guys can lay eggs as long, late as 50 days. So this is an average age, and this is an average age, um, and these are, um, you know, the maximum. So if we compare these two worms here uh, and how tolerant they are to high temperature, um, these DAF2 uh, allele uh, mutants are really um, tolerant to temperature changes. That can be an indicator of tolerance to stress. Uh, there's all kinds of different uh, mutations, but they're all better at um, tolerance to stress as temperature as an example of stress than uh, are the wild type. Uh, there are mammal versions of uh, differences in aging that are also being studied besides these worms, although I would say most of the anti-aging research is using worms now. Um, even though this looks like a wrinkled old um, nasty rat. It's actually a different species. It's a naked mole rat. They live underground. Uh, uh, in the cartoon Kim Possible, one of the characters had a naked mole rat for a pet. Um, the on average, naked mole rats, NMR, uh, can live about two years. Um, and uh, mice only live uh, about a third of a year. Um, uh, and even though they die sooner, they have more, uh, they have less protein damage. So one of the hypotheses about um, why we age is that we accumulate uh, protein damage in the forms of, of oxidative damage to our proteins over time. Um, but if given that the naked mole rats live uh, much longer than the mice, you would expect them to have um, more protection from this oxidative damage, but they don't. They actually have more damaged uh, proteins than do the mice. Uh, also more damaged lipids um, than uh, the mice compared at the same age. Um, so a naked mole rat uh, young naked mole rat versus a young uh, mouse and an old na naked mole rat versus an old mouse. Um, lots of uh, uh, protein damage and lipid damage, which you would not predict if the oxidative damage is the thing that is making them old. So there are many hypotheses as to why we age. Uh, not uh, everybody agrees in uh, aging research as to which of these are the most important for age. Certainly the protein oxidation thing is still out there. This is the idea behind the supplement industry that you take antioxidant supplements and foods advertise that they are powerful antioxidants. There are no real data that support that antioxidants um, uh, decrease aging or that prevent cancer or other disease. There are no solid data on uh, those ideas. It just, it's, a, it's just a hypothesis but not data to support those hypotheses. There's also um, the idea that your proteins can get linked together um, by exposure to the environment um, and that can cause aging. Same thing with your DNA. Your DNA 
can accumulate errors or um, mutations uh, from exposure to the environment. Uh, there's the idea of telomeres shortening. At the end of your DNA, there's a repeated uh, piece of DNA, and every time your DNA divides, that gets shorter. Um, and so there's the idea that there's only a certain amount of times your DNA can divide before you run out of telomeres. This was the idea behind Dolly the sheep, that they took a nucleus out of a six-year-old sheep and they put it in a brand new egg and then grew that uh, into a new sheep to see if the idea of old telomeres caused premature aging. And Dolly um, did die early, but it's hard to say that's because of the telomeres or there's other problems with that experiment. Um, so that one's uh, sort of still out there. Uh, there's the idea that uh, hormones change as we get older and those hormones don't support um, uh, young age and uh, young cells. Um, these are all competing hypotheses. It doesn't have to be that uh, number two, for example, is the one that is ultimately shown to have the most support. It's likely that if we figure this out, it's going to be more than one things contribute to why we age. Um, one thing that this chapter in your book does not talk about that is uh, a very prominent feature of aging research is that a low calorie diet very reliably increases lifespan in everything that has ever been tested. So from bacteria to um, primates, a low calorie diet uh, reliably increases lifespan um, and uh, the mechanism as to why that happens is um, pretty mysterious but it is a really reliable effect on that okay you made it you're at the end of principles one this is the last podcast and after you complete this uh, you want to start reviewing for your final.